Hello everyone and welcome back to our channel Politicopulse TV. Today, we are going to dive deep into one of the most controversial ideologies of the 20th century, communism. Love it or hate it, communism has played a significant role in shaping history. So, let's put on our thinking caps and embark on this engaging journey to understand the essence of communism. To start, let's break down the basics. Communism is a socio-economic ideology that aims for a classless society, where the means of production are owned and controlled by the community as a whole. It seeks to eliminate private property and create a society where resources are distributed equally. Sounds intriguing, right? There is no government or private property or currency, and the wealth is divided among citizens according to individual need. In one line, a society without class divisions or government, in which the production and distribution of goods would be based upon the principle, from each according to his ability, to each according to his needs. Communism is thus a form of socialism, a higher and more advanced form, according to its advocates. Now, let's take a look at the rise and fall of communism. It all started with the Russian Revolution in 1917, led by Vladimir Lenin and the Bolshevik Party. The Soviet Union emerged as the first communist state, inspiring other nations to adopt similar ideologies. However, the reality of communism didn't match its utopian promises, and we saw the eventual collapse of the Soviet Union and other communist regimes. Just like any other ideology, communism has its pros and cons. On one hand, it aims to eliminate social inequality, provide free education and health care, and ensure a fair distribution of resources. On the other hand, it often leads to the concentration of power in the hands of a few, limits individual freedoms, and hampers economic growth. It's a complex ideology that sparks passionate debates to this day. Because Marxism relies on the principle that everyone wants to work for the common good without an individual reward. That does not work that way. Some people are slackers, some are driven and hard-working. These people does not want to have the same payment as the slackers. It is contrary to all human psychology in every culture and every race that have ever existed. So Marxism is at fault in the most basic of principles. Marx and Engels maintained that the poverty, disease, and early death that afflicted the proletariat, the industrial working class, were endemic to capitalism. They were systemic and structural problems that could be resolved only by replacing capitalism with communism. Under this alternative system, the major means of industrial production, such as mines, mills, factories, and railroads, would be publicly owned and operated for the benefit of all. In communist theory, the final stage of human development would mark the end of class struggle and therefore of history. All people would live in social equilibrium, without class distinctions, family structures, religion, or property. The state, too, would wither away. The big question remains, is communism still relevant in the modern world? While many countries have moved away from full-fledged communism, certain aspects of the ideology still persist. We'll discuss how elements of communism have been incorporated into different political and economic systems, and why it continues to shape the global political landscape. Communism was pitted against capitalism, which relies on democracy and production of capital to form a society. Prominent examples of communism were the Soviet Union and China. While the former collapsed in 1991, the latter has drastically revised its economy to include some capitalism. Communism is the official form of government in China, Cuba, Laos, North Korea, and Vietnam. However, these countries also abide by some capitalist principles, are largely autocratic in nature, and don't reflect Marx's definition of the term. According to communist writers and thinkers, the goal of communism is to create a classless society. Communist thinkers believe this can happen if the people take away the power of the bourgeoisie, the ruling class, who own the means of production, and create a dictatorship of the proletariat, the working class. Communism failed for several reasons, including a lack of profit incentive among citizens, the failure of central planning, and the impact of power being seized by such a small number of people who then exploited it and gamed the system. Corruption and laziness became endemic features of this system and surveillance, such as characterized East German and Soviet societies, was common. It also disincentivized industrious and hard-working people. In the end, the economy suffered. Why do people think communism is bad? This answer is getting a bit of traffic, so I thought I would add an addendum to my answer. The reason why communism or socialism is bad is because they do away with the pricing mechanism. In a capitalist economy, the pricing mechanism is a handy number that tells us how much of something is available and what the demand for that thing is. From there, 
we can determine how much to buy that thing we want. For the pricing mechanism to work, it needs to be dynamic. Prices cannot be arbitrarily set by a central governing body. When we see fuel at $2 per liter, we don't think. Fuel supply chain, global competition, global demand, oil extraction, tanker transportation costs, truck transportation cost, train transportation cost, refinement, petroleum refinement, and distribution to my local gas station equals $2 per liter. We just think, fuel's $2 per liter here, wonder if I can go somewhere to get it cheaper, or I'll fill up half a tank and wait till payday, or bargain, better fill up the other car here as well. As mentioned earlier, the pricing mechanism relies on profits and losses to determine the price. We don't set fuel at $2 per liter just because we feel like that's the right price. Fuel came to that price because of the supply and demand of oil, the refinement process, the transportation cost, shareholder value, and the competition from rival fuel companies. I'm probably missing a few other key players in that chain, but think about the decision-making process for everyone who gets the oil, turns it into fuel, and then delivers it to you. The truck company doesn't care what their vehicles are being used for, all they care about is who is buying. The fuel transportation company doesn't need to know what supply chain problems may affect their trucks getting to them. All they need to worry about are the cost of the trucks, maintenance, and personnel costs. The pricing mechanism tells us everything we need to know in a way that we can properly comprehend. It doesn't directly tell us how cheaper wires reduce production time for trucks, but that will be reflected in the price of fuel. Without the pricing mechanism, we would be operating in an information vacuum, and that is what happened with the Soviets. The decline and fall of the Soviet Union has an excellent example of what happens when you no longer have a pricing mechanism to guide decision-making processes. To boost crop yields, the Soviet bureaucrats paid farmers based on how much land the farmers plowed. Since the farmers were not rewarded based on profits from crop yields, they figured out that they should cover as much land as possible when plowing the field. To cover as much ground as possible, the farmers plowed shallow furrows. Shallow furrows mean lower crop density, meaning lower crop yields. The farmers were also smart enough to plow the furrows deeper near the roads, so observers would assume the land was being used effectively. It wasn't until the crops came in did the planners see the incredible gap between the actual crop yields and what was projected. In a capitalist society, you don't pay the farmers based on how much land they cover. They get their profits, i.e. rewarded, based on how much crop they produce and how good they are when it comes to managing their production resources. This is one of the reasons why Soviet farms were ten times the size of an average American farm, but nowhere near as efficient. Another example of Soviet inefficiency is their steel production. Despite being a resource-rich country, the Soviets used more resources to produce the same quantity of steel as resource-poor nations such as Japan and Germany. Soviet factories also had to have large inventories and separate wings dedicated to producing spare parts for the main factory. This is to ensure their continual operation when disruption inevitably happened in their supply chains. For example, a timberboard factor was not able to rely on the delivery of saws, so it would often try to order as many saws as possible to have a large reserve inventory. This pulled steel away from other areas where it could be more useful, which has another knock-on effect, and creates supply uncertainty. Whereas capitalist Japan is known for just-in-time manufacturing, where their factory inventories only have enough stock to keep the factory operating for a day, though COVID has slash will change that. Free market pricing gives clear, concise, and dynamic information on what the economy is doing at a given time. With a high level of confidence in the information they are getting, the Japanese companies can focus on their own outputs and not worry about inventory and supply chains outside of their purview. Inventory is expensive to maintain, and too much of it sitting around means it's the stock is not somewhere else being better utilized. Communism sounds great in theory, only, it doesn't work in reality. Communism fails to take into human nature into account. Humans like to work hard if they get to play hard. They don't like to work hard, just so it goes to someone else. For communism to work in reality, you need a central state to control everything to ensure that everyone who can work is working and that wealth is redistributed fairly. But what is fair? Karl Marx says, from each according to his ability, to each according to his needs. So that would indicate that you would get what you deserve. You work hard, you get the good things in life. You need food, you'll get food. But who decides who gets what? In a free market society, it's the individuals who decide what they get for themselves. 
But communism doesn't like free market because that's capitalism, that leads to economic classes and wealth disparity. The flaw with communism is that it advocates for a stateless, classless society, but requires a central authority to enforce its ideology, which is to stop the formation of economic classes. Because what if we have a farmer who has worked hard for his crops and doesn't want to just give it away? He spent hours in the sun, plowing the field, sowing the seed, maintaining the irrigation. That's a lot of work. He wants to see himself rewarded for his hard work. So you need to send people with authority to the farm to take away the food to redistribute it later. And here's your first problem. The farmer is no longer working for himself, he is working for the state. If he doesn't do what the state demands of him, he will be punished. His hard work will be redistributed to someone else. That someone else could be a hard factory worker, or someone who is lazy. The farmer is now a slave to the state. No matter how much effort he puts into his work, the end result will still be the same. The farmer doesn't get to see the fruits of his labor anymore. He can't improve his own lot. Some will say the commissary will, they will give him more goods to reward him for his hard work. That sounds all fine and dandy in theory, but when has bureaucracy ever been efficient? The farmer might get lazy and not bother working as hard, so now there will be less food. After all, human sympathy rarely extends beyond our own line of sight. Why does the farmer want to produce goods for someone he will never meet if there is no increase in marginal benefits from increasing marginal cost? So here, the commissary will need to come in and make the farmer work hard. If he doesn't, he is sent off to the gulag. The farmer is basically a slave now. If the farmer was allowed to sell his goods in a free market society, at whatever price he wishes, or sell it at market price, then he will see the fruits of his labor. He will be rewarded for his work by people who want to have his goods. A factory worker will come along and buy the farmer's goods and then the two will go off on their separate ways. It's just like what Karl Marx says, from each according to his ability to each according to his need, only this time it doesn't apply to communism, but capitalism. The factory worker's wage is according to his ability and market determined prices. With those wages, the worker will purchase the farmer's goods according to his own personal need. There is no commissary involved here. But since this is a free market, the farmer can do what he wishes with the money he has made. He can make better crops, make his goods more attractive to customers, and in time he becomes wealthier. Now that's bad in a communist society. You can't have rich and poor. Communism sounds great because it doesn't sound greedy like capitalism does. People are attracted to communism because they love the idea of having a safety net that they themselves do not have to take care of themselves. They love the idea of a government taking care of them, much like how a parent takes care of a child. No one is better at spending your money than you. Unfortunately, the government spends other people's money, thus they will have no incentives to be efficient with their spending. Take away everyone's money and give them an arbitrary amount, and no one will work as hard because no matter how much they put in, it won't justify how much they get out. Communism is just a pipe dream that seems just on the surface, but in reality, is both immoral and inefficient. Boris Yeltsin, USSR President 1991-1999, in a trip to Houston with Ronald Reagan in 1989. Yeltsin's faith in communism was shattered when he saw a U.S. supermarket. He did not believe the variety and selection. He said, even the Politburo, Russian government, doesn't have this choice. Not even Mr. Gorbachev. In capitalism, the poor can eat better than the kings in communism. And that's a wrap. We hope this journey into the world of communism has sparked your curiosity and encouraged you to explore further. Remember, understanding different ideologies is crucial in shaping a better future. No single ideology is entirely good or entirely bad. Each one has valuable lessons and elements that can contribute to a better world. So, stay curious, keep learning, and don't forget to apply what you learn to make a difference. We'll catch you in the next video. Take care, and bye for now.